All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Delaware County. I am Chrissy Bushager. I'm the Director of Religious Education here. Our minister, Reverend Peter Friedrichs, is away on vacation this week, but um, I am excited to welcome back Reverend Andrew Weber, who um, was with us uh, in the fall when we were outdoors and has um, preached here at UUCDC before that as well. Reverend Weber is a Unitarian Universalist minister currently in, living in New York, Delaware, with his wife and two children. He's a part-time CrossFit coach at the University of Delaware, part-time pulpit supply minister at area congregations like us, and a full-time parent. You may notice that that is more than 100%. All of these pieces together make up a path of seeking to help people and communities live their best selves. He reflects on living a faith-formed life in an online blog called How to Drive Like a Minister. Um, our monthly Soul Matters theme is Renewing Faith. I want to remind you that um, if you're joining us online, welcome. We should say hi to our friends online. You can wave at the cameras. Hi. Uh, for those of you online, we do have captioning, and I want to remind you that um, coffee hour after the service is available, an online coffee hour in breakout rooms. So please make sure to stay for that and meet some friends online. I have the um, unfortunate job of letting everyone know that chili chocolate homebrew is canceled. Unfortunately, we had to cancel that event due to lack of people signing up to bring chili. So um, hopefully that will happen again in January of 2023. Uh, I wanna say thank you to our tech team, to our hospitality team, and uh, Lori Rice Spring is our online host today. So if you're online and you have questions, you can message Lori and she'll let you know what's going on. We're going to start our service today. We are in the middle of our fund drive. So we're going to start with a fund drive testimonial from one of our yucky youth. Hi, my name is Maggie Davies and I am a senior at Strathaven High School and I am also a part of Yuckies. For those of you who don't know, Yuckies is a group of high schoolers. We meet on Sundays uh, to talk about things that we find important, things pertaining to the community, things pertaining to the church. And um, what you might not know is that Yuckies is only one part of the larger system, which is religious education. Now, I have been going to this church since third grade when I moved here. So religious education has been Almost, it's been all of my experience at the church, really. Um, I have been doing it for years, and I have made some of my closest friends in RE. So that's why I think it's so important, not just because of the reasons of education and the, the obvious stuff, but it really does create um, connections and a bond between the kids, and it's something meaningful. So that's... I just wanted to talk about that real quick. But so with um, funding, with a little bit of a little bit more funding, we would actually be able to get Chrissy Bushyaker. We would be able to give her a full time job as the director of religious education. Now I have, I've been like I've said, I've been here for a while, so I've seen a lot of changes in the religious education um, system. But Chrissy is great, and the only thing I can think to do to improve is to be able to give her a full-time job so she can work to the best of her ability. Um, just like I'm saying, I think RE and yuckies and all of it is very important because it allows kids to be kids. It allows us to enjoy stuff, but also we are doing important things. We are doing things for the community. We do, we do our soup sales. We do we do uh, vol we volunteer sometimes it's it's a really special group to have and it's a really special thing to go through as a kid and i think it really sets our church apart from other churches so i just would i'd like you to think about that think about the system the program and think about uh what we could do to grow it and make it better so thank you Thanks, Maggie. That was the first time I've seen that, and it was all about me, which is a little <laughs> awkward, but also really nice. So thank you, Maggie, for that. Um, 
but our RU program is great, and it's great because we have youth like Maggie and our other youth who do amazing things in the world. And it's because we have people who are funding the children growing through that program from childhood to youth. So thank you all for that. That was fun. Okay, let's um, open with a hymn. We're gonna sing Peace Like a River. Remember, we can sing now with our masks on. So I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join us in I've Got Peace Like a River. Thank you, Bob. I forgot to introduce Bob Rowland, our music director with us today. Thank you. Please join me now in reading our covenant together. Enriched by our differences and joined together in our search for meaning, we covenant with ourselves and each other to seek truth in a spirit of love, to strive for justice, and to serve others with a joyful heart. Good morning. Good morning. We light our chalice, the symbol of our free faith, and we join with Unitarian Universalists across the country and around the globe this morning as we light our chalice with these words, Affirmation by Leonard Mason. We affirm the unfailing renewal of life, rising from the earth and reaching for the sun, all living creatures shall fulfill themselves. We affirm the steady growth of human companionship, rising from ancient cradles and reaching for the stars. People the world over shall seek the ways of understanding. We affirm a continuing hope that out of every tragedy, the spirits of individuals shall rise to build a better world.
I now invite us to begin to enter into that time of um, centering and relax and, and worship with our loving kindness meditation. Feel free to sing along. In a moment, I will invite you forward to drop stones into our bowl of water. As we drop stones in our bowl of water, we share our joys and our sorrows, letting the ripples flow through our community so that we can all carry those together. You may come forward. I will drop three more stones. One stone for the joys and concerns of our friends who are um, joining us on Zoom. One for the joys and concerns for those who are not able to be with us today. And a final stone um, in memory of the life of Leota Terry, who died last week after a long battle with heart disease.
marvelous truth confront us at every turn in every guise, iron ball, egg, dark horse, shadow, cloud of breath on the air, dwell in our crowded hearts, our seeming bathrooms, kitchens full of things to be done, the ordinary streets, thrust close your smile that we know you, terrible joy. Blessed be and amen. Um, now I invite you to join me in singing Spirit of Life. You may rise, embody your spirit, and we will do the movements as we sing. Sorry, sometimes the words of that song, I kind of zoned out there at the beginning. <laughs> All right, so today I have the Wonder Box with me. And we haven't had the Wonder Box, it's not a rock. We haven't had the Wonder Box in a really long time in person. So I'm very excited to have the Wonder Box with us today. If you um, don't remember what we do with the Wonder Box, I'm going to shake it and then you can guess what's inside. And I have my um, chat open so I can see what our online friends are guessing as well. So feel free to guess if you're online, just put it in the chat and we'll read some of those as well. So I'm gonna shake it. Hmm. What do you think it is? Shout something out. A ball, I heard a ball. Jacob, what do you think? A book, that's a good guess. Henry? Lemons? Oh, very specific. <laughs> Leo? Did you say rocks or locks? <laughs> rocks, not rocks. Yes, is that Finn? Cars. Cars, oh. You know, it doesn't make a rolling sound, so maybe not cars today. What do you think, Roxy? A small soccer ball. I love these very specific guesses online. We've got an apple, a shamrock, very seasonal, a candy bar, that would be wonderful. It might not be in here because it wouldn't have lasted. Let's see what it is. What do I have? A butterfly, a butterfly. yes, a butterfly. So, who knows how butterflies grow? Okay, good, I see hands up. I'm not gonna ask you, I'm gonna tell those who may not know or may not remember. So butterflies start out as an egg, right? If you've read The Very Hungry Caterpillar, you know this. They start out as an egg, and then they become a larva, and then they become a caterpillar. And then the caterpillar forms what's called a chrysalis, like a cocoon. Have you ever seen a chrysalis? I see them sometimes. The caterpillars love to eat my parsley in my garden, I sometimes think I plant it just for them because they eat it all. And sometimes they form chrysalis on the parsley plants and I get to watch the chrysalis. And then the caterpillar's body dissolves into goo. 
And somehow, from that goo, emerges a butterfly. It's kind of amazing if you think about it. So I want to tell you a story today about a man and a butterfly. Um, my friend, Don Starr, Sarah Borschelt, who is the DRE at Mainline Unitarian, told this story recently. And um, neither of us can really find where this story came from. Sometimes it's cited as a Sufi story from the Sufi mystics, but I couldn't actually find a lot of um, solid information about that. It's also cited in, in Christian mysticism. It's cited with a variety of different names attached to it, but none of those seem to pan out. So we're gonna call this a traditional tale because it doesn't seem to have um, a good uh, lineage that I could find. So the story goes like this. A man found a chrysalis. He was walking along in a park and he saw a chrysalis attached to a plant. And he watched it and it was wiggling. So he thought, ooh, this is wiggling. I bet really soon a butterfly is going to come out of this chrysalis. So he wanted to sit and watch. And he sat there, and he sat there, and he watched, and it wiggled, and it wiggled, and there was a little hole in it. And he could tell just like any second a butterfly would come out. And this went on for a really long time, like hours and hours. And he sat there, and the hole didn't get any bigger and the butterfly didn't come out, and the man started to get worried. This butterfly seemed to be struggling so much to get out of this chrysalis. This man was a kind man, a gentle man, and he did not like to see any creature struggling. He imagined, he, he assumed that this butterfly might be suffering because it was working so hard. So he decided that he would try to help. He had a pocket knife in his bag, and he took his knife and very, very carefully just cut the chrysalis open to free the butterfly. And the butterfly came out. But this butterfly had really, really shriveled up wings and a chubby butterfly body. Butterfly bodies are usually pretty thin, but this butterfly's body was really chubby with, with wrinkled wings. And the man watched the butterfly. It was kind of crawling around on the ground, and he waited. He was waiting for the miracle to happen, for the butterfly to, to uh, spread its wings and start to fly. But that didn't happen. Because the thing is that, mother, that nature has made butterflies so that they have to struggle. That process of struggling out of the chrysalis, they move liquid from their bodies into their wings. That's what makes their wings unfurl. So they need to have that struggle. And the man, in his kindness and his haste, denied the butterfly the opportunity to struggle, to do what it needed to do in order to grow. So the man learned his lesson that day. He learned not to um, prematurely end the struggle that was needed for growth. And that is my story today. Thank you for listening. All right, it is time for our children to go to religious education classes. Bob will um, sing them out with our sending song. And the first time we sing it through, our teachers will head into the lobby, and after that, our children will go to their RE classes. Thank you. So wonderful to be in person, so wonderful to see such a strong RE. At this time, we pause to
consider our support of this sacred space and the work we do here. We are now taking up our offering, which I have said, there you go, there's the information. If you're online or if you're in person, you can text as the instructions, and if you're in person, when you go out, there are some boxes at the side. We will greatly receive this morning's offering. Bless you. Good morning again. So good to be here. Our reading today is from Frederick Douglass. On August 3rd, just to give a little background, 1857, he delivered a speech at Canandaigua, New York, um, talking about the West India Emancipation. It was on the 23rd anniversary of the emancipation of the West Indies. Uh, the British government had formally abolished slavery in its colonies. And there's all sorts of issues here. I mean, we're talking about abolishing slavery in colonies. It's okay, well, there's a step there. Um, in 1830, yeah, right? I mean, in the act of 1833. And so it took, in effect, 1834, all slaves in the British Empire were considered free. Now, this is Frederick Douglass speaking in the United States where slavery was still legal. The, the Civil War was four years out and the Emancipation Proclamation four years after that. And of course, the end of oppression hasn't happened yet, so after that. In his words, let me give you a word of the philosophy of reform. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all-absorbing, and for the time being, putting all other tumults to silence. It must do this or it does nothing. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which can be imposed among them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. There ends our reading.
Thank you, thank you. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation, want crops without plowing up the ground, want rain without thunder and lightning, want ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This is not, this is not easy to hear. And it's not easy to hear, and Frederick Douglass goes on, he's talking about the people who have died or who have killed to ensure their freedom from slavery in the United States. Those people who chose to die rather than be enslaved, those people who, like Douglass, saw violence as the only resort to an evil system. And, I, and, and I'm not so sure I disagree with him. I, I tend to be a pacifist, but I don't know if I disagree with him. I didn't live through what he lived through. I can't make comments. Douglas was speaking in New York, as I said, celebrating emancipation, where in the United States, we still had slavery. It was still legal. People were still being bought, bought sold, hunted down, abused. And only four years later was the Civil War, and then four years after that, emancipation. And so was violence necessary to end slavery here? <laughs> Probably, I, I don't know. And even with slavery's end, we know that equality was not guaranteed, neither legally nor culturally, right? I mean, here we are about 150 years later in a culture in a country built on a foundation of patriarchy and white supremacy. The patriarchy, the white supremacy, which means that I have privilege just because of who I am and, and what I look like. I don't have to teach my children about being extremely careful when they preach, when they approach police officers. I don't have to worry about that. When I go for a run in the dark, I don't have to be concerned that I'm perceived as a target or a threat. Right? I mean, that's, it's, it's all of those pieces of other people's lives which I don't have to think about. That's my privilege, is I don't have to think about all of those things. That's the privilege I have. If you can live your life without having to think about race, well, that, that's, that's, your, that's the privilege, is that you don't have to think about it. So what do we do? I mean, what do we do? How do we change a system which we are so enmeshed in and born from that we, we sometimes don't even see it, right? Well, we ask for help. We do some really hard work. I, I mean, I see. I, it's dismantling racism and oppression, conversations in anti-racism and allyship, that's fantastic. I mean, this is what we do. We do the hard work. We get uncomfortable. We listen to the disturbing and maybe the unwelcome truths from people who can see the reality that we might not be able to, to recognize, that we not, might not be able to see. So I have to be open to hear uncomfortable, painful truths before I can do some really uncomfortable and painful work in my own life and in my own community. I saw a social media post recently, and you may have seen something exactly the same or similar, which highlighted this truth. It's just plain text, and it said, teach me about racism, they say, but do not hurt my feelings, make me upset, talk about violence, allude to my privilege, never ever contradict what I already believe in. <laughs> it's not gonna happen, right? That's not, you can't do that. Sometimes people say they want to get better at something. I want to get better at that. Yeah. They want to learn. They want to grow. But they're only, I only want to do this in a very comfortable, very easy fashion, a way that won't challenge or upset our lives. Teach me about racism in our culture and how I can be an anti-racist 
working toward equality. Oh, but don't, don't upset my worldview and don't challenge my understandings. Right? I mean, it's absurd. It's, it's impossible. If we want to change a system, if we want to change a system, if we actually committed to learning and working for anti-racism, then we're going to have to be challenged. We're going to have to be upset. And hopefully, yeah, yeah, hopefully we're going to lose some of our privilege. I'm speaking to myself here. I mean, I'm speaking to myself because that's the reality I know. I'm speaking to anyone with any sort of privilege. Does your identity give you a, a sort of head start or a boost up? The fight for justice is one where you lose something. It's a fight against yourself, which is, which is good, right? Growth of this kind can only come through loss, through pain, through struggle. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Oh, what a place to start, right? I thought we were talking about butterflies emerging from chrysalises on the first day of spring, right? I mean, and here the guest preacher jumps into slavery and racism. I mean, that's, uh, but yes, and, and, you know, talk about Easter, talk about new life, talk about spring, talk about life coming from death and all things being renewed. Oh, there's some parallels there. There's some parallels. Did you catch that? I mean, spring is the perfect time to talk about learning and growing and striving for a better world. The caterpillar eats a bunch of food, wraps itself up, and then boom, emerges a butterfly, right? No, 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 no. Because while in the chrysalis, we just heard, while in the chrysalis, the caterpillar becomes a pile of goo, literally. And, and it's funny, hearing that story, I and mean, we talked about what would be shared as the story, and hearing it, I was almost in tears, like, no, don't cut, don't cut the chrysalis, don't do, oh, stop, no, you're, gonna, you're not helping. We need that struggle. We need that struggle. Listen to this from Scientific America. First, the caterpillar digests itself, releasing enzymes to dissolve all of its tissues. If you were to cut open a cocoon or chrysalis, at just the right time, caterpillar soup would ooze out. Getting a look at this metamorphos metamorphosis as it happens is difficult. Disturbing a caterpillar inside its cocoon or chrysalis risks botching the transformation. It's harmed by love. Harmed by trying to do the right thing. And this is, where the, this is where the correlation comes, where the place that our faith, the butterflies, and racism all intersect. We are committed to a just world, right? I mean, this is it's part of why we're here. We want to get to a place where we're, we are instruments of peace. We are instruments of equality, of anti-racism. This is the work of um, the monthly theme of renewing faith, as I see it. We want to renew our faith to be focused on making the world a better place. And we want to be renewed by our faith, ever committed to our best selves, to our highest being, right? I mean, that's a, a big reason why we come to religious institutions. We come because we want to be better people. We come because we want to help make the world a better place. That's what religion is for, a lot of it. And, I, and just look at the mission. I love this. Front page right there. The mission. The mission of Unitarian Universalist Church of Delaware County is to ignite personal growth. Ignite personal growth. Not, I mean, this is it's a metaphor, but I've got some news for you. When you ignite something, it means you light it on fire, right? I mean, yeah, well, that's great. I want to get, I, I want to be excited about personal growth. I want to I get fired up about becoming a better person. The, the analogy works, right? We light it on fire, we're fired up. But igniting personal growth, but there's a spark of inspiration, a flame of excitement, a flame of commitment, fire of commitment. Fire is exciting, it's energetic, and fire is, fire is devastating. Fire is painful. Fire gets rid of the old and makes way for the new. If you wanna plant a field, sometimes it's best to burn what's there, the nutrients go into the soil and bring up new life. If we ignite our personal growth, we're getting to that place of letting go of our old ways, letting go of our old thinking, 
and preparing for new ways of thinking, preparing for renewal of faith, right? I mean, that's the, that's the intersection, the point where the struggle is necessary for progress, the point at which the caterpillar turns into goo in its way to transformation, the point at which we say yes to a renewal of faith, which necessitates letting go of what is comfortable, letting go of the ways of being that we know and embracing that uncomfortable reality. Sometimes we want that, we want that growth without the, without the growing pains. We want, quote, crops without plowing the ground, rain without thunder and lightning, the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Oh, but we are comfortable. Our religion tells us that we are valuable, right? I mean, that's, we're valuable. We have worth and dignity, yes. And we do have worth and dignity and value, and our work is not done. We also believe in peace, justice, compassion, liberty, equity, right? It's aspiration which comes at a cost, progress with, which comes at a struggle. So I'm talking about renewal of faith, both in community and personal. We renew our beliefs all the time. We come to new understandings, new comprehensions with respect to the world, with respect to our place in it. While at the same time, our faith compels us to renew our actions, to renew our commitments. So what does that look like? I mean, what does that, what does that look like? There's lots of words here. It looks like engaging in those difficult conversations, doing the work. It looks like going to therapy as an individual, doing that hard work of self-discovery, healing. Renewal looks like struggle. It looks like discomfort. It looks like asking for help and being open to criticism. Renewal means praying and hoping for the crops and praying and hoping for the plowing up of the ground, being ready for the rain and being ready for the lightning. It's being ready to turn into a pile of goo before transforming into something different. I, I go to therapy not because I want someone to pat me on the back and tell me I'm doing a great job. That's, that's not the point. I go to therapy because I have some stuff I want to work through. I, w I want progress, and so I get that beneficial struggle. I'm reminded here of a story I read many years ago, and it's odd how some things stick with us. And I just searched, like, what was that story about? It's um, Maniac McGee, which some of you may know, um, a well-written well children's book. And the title character called Maniac, um, through practice, gets really good at untying knots. And eventually, neighborhood children come around when their shoelaces are stuck and tied tight, whenever their yo-yos get in a tangle, and Maniac is able to untangle them all. And so he tackles larger and larger knots. And at a pivotal, pivotal moment in the tale, Maniac tackles an enormous knot that was almost mythical proportions. It's, it's, a, it's a metaphor in the story. It's this, this coming out of like showing how much power he has and how he can do this. So he succeeds in untangling this, this in immense knot. But his success wasn't what stuck with me over the years. That's not what I remembered. But what stuck with me was that in the middle of his struggle, that knot is bigger than when he started. The knot itself is, is physically larger because he's picking, searching, working, tugging here and there. The problem is bigger than when he started. And if you've ever tried to untie stuck shoelaces, yours or a child's or a parent's, someone else's, you know the truth here. You know the truth when you're like undoing a knot. There's a moment when the problem has grown, when the, the conundrum you started with is larger than what, it's larger now than what you started with. And that's the moment we're looking for. That's the moment right there, because that moment when the knot is of Herculean proportions, when there are strings going this way and that way, when, when the little ball is now larger than we can see at one glance, that is the moment when we know we are on the right path. Only when Maniac had the knot expanded and enlarged, that's the time when he can start to see how to untangle it. Only, the cat only when the caterpillar is torn apart can the butterfly start to emerge. Right? I mean, only when I start to pick through my own prejudices 
Only when I delve into my own privilege can I see what connects where and how I can transform maybe. And only when we sit with a therapist and untangle our distress or our anxiety can we start to imagine a different path forward. Only when our community gets into the thick knot of cultural oppression, internalized racism, can we conceive of untangling that thick knot. If you're an engineer type, how's that for a segue? If you're an engineer type, this is, I thought of the knot and then I was like, oh wait, there's more. There's the, the um, exploded view of a diagram of things. The motor exploded and they have all these pieces with the little arrows of where they go and maybe labels too. I love those, those are so fun to look at. It's a diagram that shows all these little internalized pieces exploded out. An engine has a schematic which shows all the pistons, all the spark plug shafts, tubes, rods, whatever's in the engine. I'm not an engineer, I'm a minister. The drawing is nice and neat, right? And it can help us diagnose problems. It can help us see areas of possible improvement. Now actually taking a tool and opening it up like that, actually taking an engine and exploding it would take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and it might be difficult to get back together the same way, right? But that's the struggle that we need to do. That's where we need to go for our progress. That's the work we need to do for our faith renewal. The struggle to open our knots up, the struggle to see ourselves in that exploded view and then see where we need to make connections, where we need to alter or change or adjust to get in there, to spend some time in those areas of pain, weakness, or fault. Oh, geez, what a downer, right? I mean, this is all downer. Isn't religious supposed to be comfort and challenge? And all I'm hearing, or all I'm saying, is challenge, challenge, struggle, 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 right? Yes, and the challenge is clear, right? The challenge is clear. The comfort comes from the same place. The comfort comes from the exact same place, and it's twofold. The one is that we can all grow. We all have that potential. We all have the amazing potential in us. And then two is that when you are most in that struggle, when you are most in that struggle, when you are that pile of goo, you might, that's a good sign you're on the right path. That's when we're most open to change, most open to transformation. If you're feeling like that pile of goo, if you're not, it's so large that you cannot see the ends. If you're in that struggle and you don't see the progress, good for you. That's where you want to be. That's where that transformation happens. You're in the perfect place for renewal and growth. You're the great place to go talk to someone, get a therapist, a friend, a colleague. If not already, talk to others, reach out to professionals, seek community. We all have opportunities for renewal. We all have potential for renewal, potential for growth. And it's not gonna be hard. I mean, switch that, reverse it. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. But we can do it with support, with the guidance of love, with the guidance of our renewing faith. So step into that struggle. Step into it. Step into that struggle. Step into the unknown. Step into the scary. Become that goo. Become a pile of goo. You can do it. Yeah. And then you can come back out transformed. You can make progress if you're open to that struggle. Amen and amen. And let us sing now about how we will get some guidance. Love will guide us. You may rise in body or in spirit.
Let us now extinguish our chalice. Do this in unison or not? No. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Although we now extinguish our chalice flame, may we hold its warmth in our hearts in all the days ahead. And I do want to remind you that chili chocolate is canceled. I'm sorry. <laughs> the benediction I know we do in unison. Please rise for the benediction. You may hold hands if you feel comfortable. Also, just put your hands out to feel that greeting and with those who are online. For those who come here seeking God, may God go with you. For those who come embracing life, may life return your affection. And for those who come to seek a path, may a way be found and the courage to take it step by step. Blessed be.